I appreciate the opportunity to present. Uh, I've got an uphill battle to present today. I've been asked to talk about adjustable gas expanding with citation uh, as the savior for the band. And don't know with 100% certainty that I can uh, say I believe that, but I'm going to do my best today to argue it to the fullest. Um, it, here are my disclosures. Uh, you will note that uh, I have received a research grant and have been a proctor for Allergan, the uh, parent company for uh, one of the adjustable gastric bands uh, in the past, and will do my best to not have that bias uh, in discussion today. Our center at Duke, uh, just briefly, uh, has been a center that um, has done gastric band or adjustable gastric banding, but has certainly been a center that was more gastric bypass uh, weighted. Uh, this uh, pie chart represents our distribution of cases approximately three years ago uh, when lap banding was about its peak with us and really represented it, uh, about 15% of our total procedures being done. And clearly in today's uh, uh, changed climate, that has shrunk down as it probably has at most centers. I was in Boston a week or so ago, as many of us at the ASMBS, and I heard Ed Mason uh, give a keynote lecture where he talked about the ideal weight loss procedure and felt that we should be striving for procedures that are safe, effective, durable, and reversible. And, you know, the lap band, uh, certainly through its history, has been safe, and some would argue that it's reversible. Um, and we've spent the last decade or so uh, working out whether or not it's effective and durable. Uh, Mark Bessler did a relatively good job kind of summing up uh, data uh, in this, and he compared in this slide on the left is gastric bypass in a histogram uh, showing a relatively normal distribution uh, that uh, shows a fairly high percent excess weight loss for most uh, comers. Um, however, on the right, the lap band uh, shows a distribution that is more, more skewed towards uh, the lower percent excess weight loss and a fairly high degree of variability um, across the group in general and has been probably some of the uh, loss of overall popularity of the band in recent times uh, due to this uh, less percent excess weight loss. Um, as we've gone through this journey with bariatric, uh, I think most of us have started to um, uh, move away from the traditional uh, theories on how bariatric surgery works, restriction, malabsorption, et cetera, and are now um, significantly interested in how the brain and the gut interact. And clearly the gut seems to create some hormones that directly or indirectly um, uh, influence the brain and figure into uh, weight loss set points and satiety, et cetera. Um, and the uh, hindgut theory um, has been a prevailing theory for the last couple of years where rapid delivery of undigested nutrients into the digital small bowel triggers, triggers production of hormones like GLP-1 and PDYY. We know that the various different procedures affect these gut hormones differently. And the adjustable gastric band um, uh, has if anything, increased ghrelin, which is uh, um, the hung hunger hormone that we'd like to see decreased, hasn't had much effect on GLP-1, and a few studies showed, showed increased PYY. And sleeve gastrectomy, on the other hand, has um, uh, shows decreased levels of ghrelin and um, also, somewhat surprisingly, increased levels of GLP-1 and PYY. Um, which were certainly interesting findings to it. And as you look at these operations and their metabolic effects, as they cause more and more metabolic effects, that correlates with greater degrees of diabetes resolution and typically weight loss. And in this study, uh, we see that with gastric banding being the least, followed by gastric bypass and duodenal switch. Um, and clearly, 
you know, with these hormonal effects of the sleeve, we have to question then, is it a restrictive procedure as was originally proposed? And we now know to this day that there are several studies that show that it is actually speeds transit through it and therefore is able to trigger some of those hind hormones like the GLP-1 and uh, PYY. Next slide again. Um, throughout all this, when I was listening to Ed Mason speak in Boston, he talked a lot about finding this ideal procedure and he actually spoke about in his lecture gastric plication and uh, potential desires to investigate that. And uh, Dr. Talapur for I, from Iran uh, was probably the first that made uh, good clinical use of gastric plication. And this is a abstract that he had placed out in, uh, initially, uh, later followed by some further papers in the next slide, please, um, where he followed 800 patients um, and showed some fairly significant weight loss, which I'll show in the next slide. But also in the pictures, you can see that in a greater curve plication, uh, the, the, the stomach has been plicated inward or invaginated such that the greater curve is attempted to almost be approximated to the lesser curve uh, to create a high degree of restriction by way of this procedure. And Dr. Palafor, in his 10-year outcome, showed um, some pretty significant percent excess weight loss, which seems similar to that which most of us uh, have seen with gastric bypass. By year two, saw about a 70% excess weight loss, but did see a decrease uh, out at year 10, down to a little above 40%. And clearly, this is data that I think all of us would want to see those data sets replicated and are uncertain that they would be replicated in larger series. But clearly, uh, at least many of us predict that some of the hormonal effects that have allowed it to work might be similar mechanisms to that of the gastric plication. Um, but gastric plication alone uh, has seen some complication profile as well. It technically requires a level of precision. Uh, here's a picture that I took from the International Bariatric Club, part of uh, the Cleveland Clinic group. Um, and in the picture in the upper right, it shows the mucosa of the plicated stomach that has herniated up through the gastroesophageal junction and is causing um, obstruction of this region. Uh, this is a video that I got from George Hopkins from Sydney, and unfortunately, uh, due to the limitations of presenting from China, it's not going to play properly, but it shows a gastric plication with what I'll call interstitch herniations, um, being the two large uh, circular portions of stomach that are bulging outward. And you can see that in the lower portion, uh, there is um, a black area in the center uh, where it's leaking from. And this has certainly been some of the uh, concerns that we've had with greater curve plication because it's required um, invaginating in large amounts of stomach um, that puts a significant amount of uh, pressure on the, on the stomach and can lead to uh, tears at sites of the stitches. Um, which led to some hypothesis from our group um, on how we might change it up just slightly we thought that potentially you could place a lap band in a fashion that we are all familiar with, placing the band the way we've all been trained to, but potentially add some plication down below, less aggressive plication that's than what seems to be done in the traditional plication, as simply a means of adding a potential hormonal mechanism to the band by way of trying to increase transit through the stomach and trigger some of the hindgut hormones. Now, there are other groups that have done bandwidth plication as well, where they plicate the stomach all the way up and then place a band on it as well. And in the limited amount of data that's available, um, this certainly muddies uh, the, the, the waters. Our thought was that by placing the band as it always had been, um, uh, perhaps it would behave more similarly to what it had before. Uh, and clearly the thought and hope with this 
was that it would uh, push the uh, weight loss distribution that is skewed towards the lower percent excess weight loss in Mark Settler's Fessler study up towards that uh, greater percent excess weight loss by hopefully triggering some hormonal effects uh, uh, to add to this. In the published literature, there's fairly little data that's out there. Um, in the uh, top line of this slide, uh, the group from Taiwan, Wong et al., um, they have probably the largest series of uh, band uh, with plication, and they plicated the stomach all the way up and then placed the band on it. And they have 12-month uh, data uh, with about a 55% uh, excess weight loss at that time. They also, though, uh, that same group uh, data is depicted at the bottom of uh, this chart, uh, they had some complications with this. It was a small set of patients, only 26, um, but they did have vomiting uh, in several, uh, but then also had some more significant complications. They had two gastrogastric uh which for me in reading their papers is a little difficult to exactly determine what that is, um, but they were fairly significant complications nonetheless. Um, here is a slide where it compares uh, the data of bandwidth plication to just greater curve plication, and the mustard colored slide or uh, curve is the bandwidth plication uh, done by the Taiwanese group and carried out about 18 months um, is certainly comparable to greater curve plication alone. Um, clearly in Talapor's data, there was some significant weight regain over time, and it, it was hypothesized that potentially the stomach will stretch over time, and it's theorized that bandwidth plication, by way of having the band in place and being able to be adjusted, would help prevent this regain of weight over time and would potentially protect the plication for some degree of dilation by way of being an obstruction above the plication to help keep it from stretching out over time. Clearly, this is all theorized at this point. Um, our center got to start to take place in a double-blinded, double randomized controlled trial with UPMC that was being funded by Allergan. Um, when Allergan um, uh, sold off the band, uh, funding was pulled from this trial and therefore it has been unable to continue forward as a result of that. The trial was uh, powered in such a way that it was most uh, concerned with looking at the GI hormonal effect uh, that would um, uh, occur from this surgery, and uh, we're currently looking for other funding sources to keep going with this. I can tell you anecdotally, since our, we don't have enough data to fully analyze well, that patients seem to have a rapid weight loss velocity initially with bandwidth plication, but then seem to uh, uh, follow uh, the curves similar to greater curve plication um, alone as we saw in the previous slide. So in conclusion, um, you know, I think that we uh, as bariatric surgeons need to strive for, as Dr. Mason put it, a perfect bariatric procedure. Um, getting there will uh, take us understanding the mechanisms of how they work and then trying to design operations to properly exploit these mechanisms. And that's where our theories with bandwidth plication were setting out to try to do. Um, I think the jury is still out on, on, on it. We certainly need data to do that. And I'm somewhat concerned that in the current plan, plan climate that we may not get the answer. Great, Dana. Thanks so much. That was a great overview. Um, and before we go to discussion, we'll have uh, another uh, viewpoint from Dr. Scott Shakora at Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, in Boston. Good morning, yeah. Scott, and welcome. Good morning, Stacy. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. So uh, Dana made my job very easy. We're uh, showing many of the same studies, and that demonstrates how little data there truly is on this. And I was asked to take the opposite opinion, 
that gastric banding and plication is not the savior of the laparoscopic adjustable gastric band. These are my, uh, my disclosures. None of them have any bearing on this presentation. So I think if you, unless you just stepped off a rocket ship from Jupiter, you would know that the laparoscopic adjustable gastric band has demonstrated itself to be an inferior operation to sleeves and gastric bypasses, duodenal switches, et cetera. And for that reason, the popularity of the band has dramatically dropped, as I'll show you, to the point that some believe it's going to go extinct. So the question that we were asked today is, adding plication to a band, will that save the band? And again, here's the band. When the band came out in the mid-90s, everybody thought this was the greatest breakthrough in bariatric surgery maybe in its history, that we now had an extremely safe, laparoscopically placed, adjustable weight loss device that would be patient friendly, that didn't involve stapling, that would have a very low leak rate, and a lot of the complications of the gastric bypass. But unfortunately, over a year's time, it became pretty obvious that wasn't the case. Although some of the earlier studies suggested high weight loss, I would think it's fair to say that weight loss was more in the range of 40% excess weight loss, and this was generally not intended to treat. So these were patients who kept their bands. It did not include those who failed, and the bands were removed. And over time, more and more of these bands have been uh, removed, some estimates as high as 1 in 5 or 20%. Now, this is a study by Michelle Suter in Switzerland, and as you know, prior to the FDA approving the band in the United States, the ban was the procedure of choice throughout much of the world, including Europe. Well, Michelle here looked at his experience over the past seven years with bans. He had excellent follow-up in the Swiss system, but he noted extremely high complication rates, reoperation rates, and if you use the 50% or greater excess weight loss as a barometer of sex, uh, success versus failure, about seven years, the failure rate was greater than a third of the patients. And again, while this is a published study, this is also the anecdotal experience of most of us in the field who nowadays, in a very large program that does over 500 cases a year, we may place one or two bands, but we may take out 40 or 50. And the consequence of the poor results has demonstrated itself in very uh, few people wanting bands. Bands in many places were the only operation being performed, and even in the U.S., if you look at 2010, 2011, band practice was maybe one in five across the United States, and currently it's 4.1 percent. I've recently seen data from the rest of the world, and it's very, very similar, where the, uh, in, the percentage of bariatric procedures being done as bands is, is less than 10 percent, and that number will likely continue to drop. So I think the question is the laparoscopic adjustable gastric band a failed therapy. And I think it fits the criteria for failure in that it didn't achieve the results that it was supposed to, and more bands are being taken out than put in. So what about plication? Plication was said to be the poor man's sleep gastrectomy. It was supposed to be an extremely important operation for parts of the world where stapling devices were too expensive. Because there's no cutting and staple lines, it was said to be safe, few side effects. But the main issue is, one, the long-term efficacy, and also we don't understand how it works. There's very little data on whether there are hormonal changes or whether there are uh, motility changes. We do have some of that data with the sleeve, but not with plication. So to say that it's truly a sleeve without cutting may not be fair. This is what the plication looks like. And yes, on the outside, it does resemble the sleeve. And from the inside, it doesn't because the uh, you're not removing or volume reducing the stomach. You're just sort of rolling it in on itself. That's uh, data from one of Stacy's publications in the sort a couple of years ago. Now, you saw this slide from Dana earlier. And if you look at it, the studies that have looked at the plication early on, 12 months, 18 months, would say, that's pretty impressive, and Talonfor's data actually goes out in this study to three years. And once again, if you compare it to gastric bypass, to sleeve gastrectomy, at least in this single snapshot, 
it looks pretty comparable to say, yeah, there may be something here. But I also want to refer to the talent work paper that Dana referred to. The 800 applications performed over 12 years, mean follow-up was only five years. But I want to point out to you, look at the curve. One-third of patients regained lost weight, and even the mean for the group fell almost by 50%. So the question is, if you follow that out a little bit longer, would this procedure also fail as a weight loss fail procedure because of lack of long-term efficacy? We've seen over the years many operations, many devices demonstrate exciting results 12 months, 18 months, only to fall off the map and to disappear. And I wonder if the plication isn't similar. So this is the concept, to take a band which has not worked to our expectation and add a plication to it for the sake of either achieving the hormonal effects of the sleeve, which once again I'm going to say are unproven, to change the motility of the small bowel like the sleeve does, once again unproven, or maybe just volume reduce the fundus below the, the band. And there aren't very many studies. Uh, this study by Patton Shetty looked at 80 patients. So I want to point out a few things from this study. Low BMI patient population to begin with, where the mean was 38. They played around with putting the band in first versus doing the plication first. But I want to point out to you that their paper said at 24 months, the weight loss was 65% of excess. Well, that's terrific. You would say that's gastric bypass weight loss. But look at the data a little more closely. Look at the number of patients in 24 months, 11, 24%. So you're seeing only a small fraction of those patients that have been implanted with the band and then plicated. We don't know whether that's going to demonstrate as the uh, additional patients who start to populate the 24-month follow-up point, if that weight loss of 60-something percent is going to hold up, and it may not. You saw this study by uh, Dr. Wang, 60 patients, uh, where they compared 30 of the banded plication versus 30 of the sleeve gastrectomy, and their conclusion was that in two years, the results were comparable. But here's their data. Look at 24 months. Eight patients had the plication, and nine patients had the sleeve. That's about 27% for plication, only 30% follow-up for sleeve. That doesn't tell you that this is a good technology. There's not enough data. The follow-up is also too short. So what are the concerns? Well, when the plication came out, one of the biggest positive remarks made about it was it's less expensive than a sleeve gastrectomy, and therefore it would be uh, probably very, very attractive to parts of the world where they can't afford staplers. Well, the band is $3,500. If you add the band to the plication, that's the cost of a sleeve. Is it really reversible? We've all taken out bands and notice how difficult taking down the gastric wrap was and the changes to the architecture of the stomach from the band. I've taken down a plication and found that although it was uh, rare to take it down, that stomach is not a normal stomach. I think the word reversible cannot be used. Removable, maybe. Now, the band's a foreign body. Plication has a 1% to 2% leak rate, not very different than sleeve, even though you're not using staple devices. What if the stomach leaks with the band above it? Now you have a contaminated foreign body. But the biggest issues are the last two bullets. We do not have long-term efficacy data. We have very few studies containing very few patients with extremely short follow-up. And that prevents us from making any good conclusions about this uh, procedure. So in my conclusion, I want to say that the laparoscopic adjustable gastric banded plication is not yet proven to be the savior of the band. You've taken a failed therapy of the band. You've added an unproven therapy, which is the plication to it. And I think it's a little bit optimistic, maybe a little foolhardy, to then conclude that will be a successful therapy. Thank you very much, Stacy. I appreciated the opportunity to present the site today. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. That was excellent. Um
Before we uh, launch into our discussion, I'll go to a few of the sites. I, I do want to point out that and make it clear that um, the ASMBS has a position statement on any sort of plication procedure stating that this is still considered investigational, should be done under IRB protocol, um, and this is not a standard of care uh, type procedure. So just wanted to make that small disclaimer. Uh, and we do have a question from one of my uh, former partners, uh, Kevin L. Hayek at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, and this, I guess this question can be directed to Dana. He asks, uh, with such a high rate of long-term reoperations with banding alone, do you uh, believe this rate will increase with the plication band combo, uh, therefore making, you know, compounding those long-term complication risks? So what, what's your experience been, Dana, with the, long, the folks that you've had uh, out for several years with this combination therapy? Well, I think, you know, of course, the, the volumes are overall relatively small, so we, uh, don't know the full picture. Uh, I think you could look at this at one of two ways. Um, there actually is a paper that I did not stick into the slide set today where they used plication after band slippage to try to help prevent uh, further slippage of the band of, of, the, of the band or of the stomach uh, down the line. By way of plicating the stomach in, there was no means for stomach to herniate up through the band as such so-called anterior slippage, if you will. Uh, so there is some evidence and, and a little bit of publication that, uh, that maybe it could actually decrease it. But certainly then on the other, other side of, uh, you know, a band, we long-term we have erosion, we have problems like that. And I think the jury's out. I think all of us that have done bands um, and are certainly, certainly in this band climate uh, leery about... Uh, what the potential future is with that, um, but I just don't think we really have an update to know for sure. Great, thanks. Um, let's go to one of our sites now. Um, if if uh, we can join Mount Sinai Medical Center, uh, see who's joined us from Mount Sinai this morning, and get some uh, thoughts on this combination of therapy. Is anybody, who's there this morning? Is Dan there, Barry? Hi. Who's this? No, this is Subhash Kinney here. Dan. Uh, Dan and uh, Barry are both not here. Okay. We've not had any uh, experience with with the plication. My only concern is the plication was uh, used as an open procedure and was found to have failed. Uh, I know we have had small studies and even up to a few years data, but the long-term results, uh, I mean, we don't have any. And uh, how do we expect that in the laparoscopic area, era, they will have better results than what they had in the open era, and this is a discarded operation in the past. That's a good question. Dana, can you reply to that? Well, I mean, I think the only long-term data that we really have is Palapore put out um, a paper that has the 10-year data, and I think as Dr. Jakura, uh, you know, showed, it has significant weight loss early and then some significant weight regain over time. Um, you know, that weight regain over time, though, might be comparable to some other procedures uh, if we collect the data uh, well and realistically, but it is certainly more weight regain than we would like and um, I think it's clearly an area of concern for all of us and I think it's probably why uh, we have not seen uh, plication um, take off as much as the original hype uh, had led us to believe it might. Great, thanks, Dana. Um, well, I'll ask you, Scott, then. So, so we, we, you know, what data we have demonstrates that there's probably a little greater weight regain after plication than what we're, you know, seeing so far with the sleeve, but. Um, as you know, we have very limited options in what we can offer patients. And so what are your thoughts on trying to find new procedures and new innovative combination therapies that can fill some of these gaps in our armamentarium? Well, I think that's quite important, and I agree with you that we have limited uh, options currently available. I applaud this concept, and I urge that it be studied with larger numbers of patients and longer follow-up to prove whether it is successful or not, and maybe ultimately it could be successful, but I just think that the current data doesn't support it. Uh, 
I think if you really look at even the results of those few studies, you wonder what did the plication truly add to the band because so many of the band studies got the same weight loss at the 12-month, 18-month, and 24-month period. Uh, I also noted that looking at the data, the limited data from the plication studies, the banded plication, it resembles the BBG experience, vertical banded gastroplasty, where for the first couple of years you get great weight loss. And Dr. Mason, in fact, thought we should be doing it instead of gastric bypass. And then the procedure fell off the face of the earth because long term it didn't hold up. That's a great point. I think, uh, I think as we yeah, all. I just like the, the, yeah, go ahead. The, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say that I, I think that the, 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 some of the concepts of this of uh, trying to add extra hormonal elements uh, to an existing procedure is certainly a concept that I like. I don't know if this is exactly the right model to it, but I think these are the things that we should be striving to do to figure out how our procedures work and then kind of enhance or optimize those to further supercharge, if you will, their hormonal effects, and um, that was clearly our uh, stab at trying to do that, and clearly want to finish uh, uh, studying that, and that's what we should all work to do in this arena. Thanks, Dana. So we're going to jump to Virginia Commonwealth uh, Medical Center and get some opinions there. So, good morning. Do we have any uh, any folks from VCU this morning? I guess our opinion is, is there's uh, not enough data to recommend this. Um, we've been talking here about how we've been actually kind of laughing here that we probably wouldn't recommend this to most of our patients. Uh, our weight loss from sleeves and uh, bypasses is very good. We also don't do bands very often. Like the other gentleman said, uh, we probably put in one band in the last year or two. Great. Thank, thanks a lot. Um, uh, let's go to, is Mass General online? Oh, same, same site, okay. All right. Uh, how about uh, The Ohio State University? I know I uh, severely offended them when I left out the The earlier, so we'll jump to uh, Columbus. Is, 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 uh, so you guys have done some uh, banded plications and plications. I know uh, Brad uh, Needleman was part of a, a multi-center trial that we participated in with uh, Martin Fried from the Czech Republic, and so that's uh, unpublished data. Hopefully, we'll get that published soon. But that was a multi-center trial that really uh, looked at one-year outcomes and demonstrated about 40 percent excess weight loss uh, across the board. But what really that study showed us was that no matter how much you try to standardize this procedure. Um, you're going to get variable outcomes depending on the center and the techniques. And so there was quite a bit of variability between sites, um, between the three sites in terms of excess weight loss, even at one year. So have you guys, uh, you, I'm assuming you guys are the, the fellows uh, on the team or is that true? Yeah, residents? I'm okay. one of the fellows. Oh, okay. So do you, uh, have you seen residents. some patients coming back who've had plications and what are your thoughts on them, on their, on their progress? We really haven't seen that many people coming back asking for applications. Um, we still have the open IRB for the uh, band with application, but are having a hard time enrolling patients in that um, study. So um, we just don't have an, enough experience here. So it never really took off in your program? I think we've had no. a similar experience. You know, we, we, we did these initial pilot studies and then we, um, thought that we were going to have the floodgates open, as I think many people did, because of the sort of appeal that this procedure had. But uh, as it turns out, after those pilot studies were closed, we really did not see um, a, a high volume of patients. We also still have an IRB open uh, for this procedure, but uh, rarely do the procedure. I think enthusiasm has waned. Uh, and as we've seen our patients get uh, further out, we have had some real success stories, and we've also had some folks who've really struggled to, to maintain their weight loss. And so the variability is quite, quite large. And I think um, one of the things we always want to try to achieve with these operations is some degree of predictability and durability. And, and perhaps this operation is, is not there with the plication alone. Uh, and with that comment, I'll jump back for some closing comments to Dana and Scott. So Dana, where do you, you know, where do you predict this going? Is this, is this uh, just the ending, the last chapter of this uh, story, or is there more to come? 
You know, I think that plantation seemed to start in um, some countries where there was difficulty in fording staplers, et cetera. Um, it may be that there is some role for plantation alone in uh, those areas, um, but certainly it will require longer-term studies to kind of determine whether that should be there or not. Um, I, I think the concept of bandwidth plication and altering hormones with that, um, you know, warrant further study, but I think we've all highlighted that we're in an era now where it's very difficult to recruit patients into these studies, and therefore I think it's unlikely that most of them are going to continue, and therefore this probably is not going to be an approach that is uh, used much in the future. Um, but my push would be for us to be, you know, looking for mechanistic uh, approaches to um, improve our procedures and hopefully we can do that. Great. Well, thanks so much, Dan. I really appreciate you participating in the program and joining us from China. Uh, and I think uh, technologically it worked out great, uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, Scott, I'll go to you for the last word. And uh, first a question. So if you see a patient who's had a banded plication, Scott, uh, who has uh, regained their weight or failed to lose adequate weight, what would you convert them to? And then after that, maybe just offer some final thoughts on, on where this may be going, if, if anywhere. Well, that's a great question. I, I guess it would involve a discussion with the patient. Do you want a sleeve or a bypass? And you'd have to go over all the risks and benefits of both, both procedures, and it may be determined by what the patient's wishes are. Uh, some people would say if you fail a sleeve-like procedure, don't do a sleeve, do the bypass. But a lot of patients don't want a bypass. So I think that would be an open-ended discussion between me and the patient. So where do, where do I see this going? I'd like to see this research better. I don't think we want to bury it just now. If you ask me where do I think this could fit in, I would think that this would be better as a rescue procedure for a patient with a band who may not want a sleeve or a gastric bypass. But I'm not sure that this should be a standalone, that people should be coming into your program and asking for a band implication because I see the, the downside of both procedures, but I don't see the upside. And I think for the third world, in places where staplers are quite expensive, the addition of the band negates any benefit in the savings of deplication. So I think this may be something that would be open to people who are struggling and have a band that would like to try to keep it. Great. Well, thanks so much, Scott. I appreciate your, your talk, which was excellent, and all your comments.